Allah. So Alhamdulillah, today is the third uh, of um, our Saturday talks. Um, last week we heard from Dr. Uthman, mashallah, on the story of Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam. Uh, and today we're moving on to the story of the boy and the king. Uh, the story of the boy and the king is told to us in a, a long hadith in Sahih Muslim. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also references it in uh, Surah Al-Buruj. Ashab al ukhdud the people of the ditch. So inshallah, as the tradition we have with this Shaykh Abdul Rahman, who's going to start off with the recitation of Surah Al-Buruj, and then we'll go into the story inshallah. It's uh, blocking a number of cars in the car park. 
So A D twenty three F J X Vauxhall. Any more? Huh? Okay. Um, okay, so as I said, from the, the Prophet Ali Islam, he mentioned that from the people of the past there was a king who had a sorcerer. A sorcerer is somebody who uh, is involved in magic. And the sorcerer was growing old in age. And so he said to the king that I'm getting old, send me a young boy so I can teach that young boy my sorcery, my magic. And that young boy can take over from me. Now what we're going to do is we're going to stop at certain parts of the story and just reflect on certain um, certain points inshallah. So first and foremost we see what is that this old man, this sorcerer, his emphasis on passing on the teachings to somebody younger. Uh, and that of course for us as well is important. Now when we think about what are we passing on to the next generation? What is it that you're passing on to your children? What is it that you're passing on to your grandchildren? When it comes to teachings, when it comes to um, what you want them to understand or what you want them to learn. Um, and he specifically asked for what? A young boy. Why? Because we know that when someone's young, the mind is fresh. Yes, the mind hasn't been polluted. Uh, what they can memorize when they're young, it's very difficult to do when they get older. Yes, so somebody who's 10, 12, 14 years old, it's a lot easier for a child at that age to memorize than for someone who's 50, 60 years old. Okay, so, and of course, young years are years where you can really do a lot. Uh, if you want to memorize the Quran, memorize it when you're young. If you want to learn a language, learn a language when you're young. Again, why? Because the mind is fresh and it's a lot easier um, to do things uh, at that young age. And of course, whatever you do when you're young as well, you know that it sticks, it's a lot stronger. Um, so here we find that this king, he wanted a young person that he could pass his teachings on to. Uh, and as I said, for us it's important that we also reflect on what is it we're passing on to the next generation. Even when it comes to the, the idea of teaching your children or your grandchildren Islam, what does that mean? I and mean, what is Islam? We find that the emphasis has always been on what? Make sure your child can read the Quran. How many times, you know, when I used to be involved a lot more in the madrasa, many years ago here at the masjid, I remember we'd do an open day and parents would come and the first question they would ask is, how long will it take my child to finish the Quran? And that was the key goal. Everybody was concerned with what? I want my child to finish the Quran. And finishing the Quran is great, don't get me wrong, it's an amazing achievement, mashallah, if your child can read the Quran fluently and finish the Quran. But the key focus is nobody asks the question, how is my child going to understand the Quran? Is there any emphasis on understanding this deen or the religion or whatnot? It was just on Quran. And that mentality, of course, has to change. Because we've seen a whole generation grow up of kids that just learned how to read the Quran. But they never learned the Quran itself, meaning the message of the Quran. They never learned what is Islam? How do I live by this deen? What does this deen teach me? What are the principles of this deen? Let's say, unless you teach that to the next generation, again you're going to lose a generation. Why? Because they're not understanding any the whole uh, maqsad of this deen and what this deen actually comes with. So this is again an important point for, for us to reflect on what is it that we want our children our, or our grandchildren to learn when it comes to their religion and this deen. Anyway, the, the story goes on. He says that, uh, so the king got a young boy and he sent this young boy to the sorcerer to go and train in magic. Yeah, the sorcerer is now going to take over, so the young boy is going to take over. So he's got now a bright future ahead of him. Um, but when one day when he was on his way to visit the sorcerer, the young boy came across a monk. Okay, somebody who was dedicated to worship, somebody who was upon the uh, Tawheed, the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one God. So this young boy, when he comes across this monk, he sits down and he listens to this monk. Okay, so the, as I said, this monk at that time was somebody who was upon the teachings of they said Isa salam, the original teachings of Isa salam, in terms of worshipping one God. So when this young boy sat with the monk, he started to listen to the monk. And the monk was talking about the oneness of God, was talking about uh, worship, ibadah, etc. And he was very impressed okay with the monk he was very impressed with what he was listening to and you can imagine what is he listening to he's listening to some form of scripture from the monk so the young boy he listens to the monk and then he makes his way and to the sorcerer and he would sit with the sorcerer and he wouldn't really get much from the sorcerer he's learning what magic but he was as i said very impressed with the monk so every day on the way to the sorcerer he would stop by at the monk and he would go and learn from the monk 
And then on the way back, they also mentioned that he would stop by the monk and learn again from the monk. And then he would go home. And, you know, what happened is the sorcerer kept saying to him that, why are you always late? I give you a time to come here and you're always late. So he got very angry with him. Um, and he actually, he mentions in the narration that he beat the young boy. So the young boy, you know, subhanAllah, you, you have that, isn't it? Even those of you who can remember your madrasa days. Yeah. With the Malvi, you get the stick out if you mess around. Yeah, so this also was the same. Yeah, he got the stick out and he was sorting out this young boy. So the young boy anyway, uh, he told the monk. The monk said to him that, look, every time you go to the sorcerer, tell him that the reason I'm delayed is because my family have kept me behind. Okay, my family got, got me doing things. And um, he said that if your family asks you why are you delayed, then say the sorcerer kept me. But on the way and on the way back, he would always stop by the monk and learn from the monk. Um, and of course, what, another point for us to reflect on is what was, what was it that this young boy was impressed by when he met the monk? It was Tawheed. It was yeah, I mean, understanding the oneness of God, the, the te original teachings of Isa alayhi salam, who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. How you have to have a direct connection with Allah. How I mean, this, this deen, of course, we believe Islam is the deen that all the prophets came with. Okay, submission to one God. So he was impressed by scripture and that's the impact that scripture can have, revelation can have. And we know the story of Umar radiallahu anhu. Umar radiallahu anhu was on his way to kill the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa He's on his way to kill the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And he then, as you know, he ends up at his sister's home. And eventually he starts to listen to the Quran, Surah Taha being recited. And Surah Taha entered his heart. And then he went and accepted Islam at the hands of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa You also learn the, that there is a struggle involved. Yes, this young boy, he had to struggle. You're going to learn from the sorcerer and then the monk and, and whatnot. And that's part and parcel of coming close to deen, is that there's going to be some level of struggle involved. If you want to get close to Allah, it's not always going to be easy. Yes, sometimes you're going to be tested, sometimes it's going to be struggle. Look at the story of Salman al Farisi. Yeah, the story of Salman al Farisi, well known story. How he traveled from uh, Iraq to Sham to Turkey, all of these different uh, countries he's visiting one by one to go and learn from somebody who's upon the original teachings of Isa alayhi salam. And eventually he ends up in Medina. After many, many years, when he tells this story of how he had to travel everywhere, what? In search for the truth. So this is struggle that's, that's required when it comes to learning the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The narration goes on that the young boy, he says that one day there came a, a huge beast and this beast was in the marketplace and it was stopping the way. Then yeah, nobody could pass by. And the young boy, he said, I picked up a rock and I called upon Allah and I said, if the way of the monk is true, then he wanted to find out which way is true. Is it the way of the monk or is it the way of the sorcerer? So he said, if the way of the monk is true, then cause death to this beast so the people can pass by freely. And he hits, uh, he throws the, the rock, the large rock, and it ends up killing or bringing death to the animal. Um, and now people can move about freely. And now he realized what? That the way of the monk is true. The way of the monk is true, not the way of the sorcerer. And so he came to the monk and he told him. You know, as we said, when I say monk, what we, we're not referring to modern day monks. We're referring to those who, of course, in those days were upon the original teachings of Tawheed. So he went to this monk and he told him what happened. And the monk said that you are better than me. Yes, you've reached a station where you are better than me. That God is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you this, this clear guidance. And he said that soon you're going to be put to the test. So imagine he's telling this young boy that you're going to be tested now. Yeah, life moving forward isn't going to be easy. You're going to be subjected to different tests. And he said, when you're tested, don't reveal my identity. Don't tell the people who I am, that it was me that was teaching you. And there was a reason behind that we'll, we'll come on to. Um, another lesson, of course, we learn here is what? Is that tests are part and parcel of life. Yes, you're always going to be tested in one form or another. Yeah, either you'll be tested with prosperity, yeah, where, all, where, where times are good and, and there's, um, you know, everything is going well. Or sometimes you're going to be tested with, um, with hardship. 
Sometimes you're going to be tested with poverty or illness or family issues. There are different tests that people are going to face in life. Uh, and tests, as I said, in Surah Al-Ankabut, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that do the people think they're going to say we believe and they won't be tested? Rather, you're going to be tested like the people before were tested. And the purpose of the test is what? Is that Allah draws you closer to Him. I always share the story of a cousin of mine who was, um, many years ago she was diagnosed with cancer. Um, I think it was stage 3 cancer at the time. Many years ago. And I remember when I messaged her, she lives in America, I asked her, I said, is, you know, how are you feeling? Is everything okay? And at that time she was going through chemotherapy. And she said to me that the chemotherapy is very difficult. I've never experienced anything like it. My body is, 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 is you know, it's, it's, um, it's beaten, it's, it's, I feel no energy, and it's a very tough time. And then she said, however, I've never felt this close to Allah. I've never felt this close to Allah. Look at that trial, being put through cancer, chemotherapy, your body shutting down on you. Yes, but she says, I've never felt this close to Allah. And that's what, subhanAllah, the test, if that test brings you closer to Allah, then you know that that test is a blessing. Yes, that cancer for the sister is a blessing. Why? Because through it, she's come closer to Allah. And that's ultimately what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants when He tests you with something, is that you come closer to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anyway, the uh, story goes on that the young boy, he began to uh, heal the blind and those who were suffering from different types of diseases, leprosy, etc. And when he started to do this, you know, he became renowned. People were going to him to get cured from different illnesses. And the king had a companion, the king had somebody who was close to him. And this person was blind. So when he heard about this young boy, he went to the young boy. And he said to the young boy that, um, you know, I'm blind and I've heard that you can cure the blind. And he brought lots of gifts for the young boy. And he presented them to the young boy. And what did the young boy say? He said that, I do not cure the blind. Yes, I'm not the one who cures. Rather, it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who cures. Yes, rather it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who cures and, and, and gives um, shifa. He said, believe in Allah and call upon Allah and ask from Allah and Allah will give you shifa. Yes, I will also make dua for you. But this isn't in my hands, it's what? It's in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this man went away, he thought about what the young boy said, he accepted Islam. As I said, he accepted submission to Allah. And he made dua to Allah and he was cured. When he went back and sat next to the king, of course now the king saying, how's your eyesight come back? How are you allowed to, uh, uh, able to see now? And he said that my lord cured me. So the king said, who's your lord? You have a lord other than me. Meaning, well, I'm your king, I'm your lord. You don't have any other lord other than me. And then he said that my lord is Allah and your lord is Allah. And then the king got angry. He said, who taught you this? Where does this come from? So he revealed um, the identity of the young boy. He said, it's this young boy who taught me this. Now, subhanAllah, again, one or two lessons before we move on, is you look at the humility of the young boy. The young boy, his, his uh, status, has, uh, uh, status has been raised. His reputation has been raised. As everybody's looking up to him. Uh, people are giving him all sorts of accolades. He's got all sorts of fame. But he didn't let that get to his head. He didn't let that delude him. What did he say? He said, no, I'm nothing. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who cures. And sometimes, you know, in life when we get praised, we start to think that we're maybe something special or, or whatnot. And we forget the role of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in everything. That all is that belongs to Allah. All honor belongs to Allah. That really we are, are nothing. If it's not for Allah's mercy upon us, we're nothing. So this young boy, he realized that, that everything is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He never became deluded because of his fame. That's like you see today, people when they become famous, they start to, you know, as I said, think that there's something. And they forget that everything they have is because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what does the boy also teach? He teaches us that the cure comes from Allah. That the only one who can cure is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The cure does not lie in my hands. And this is a very important point for us to understand as well. Ibrahim is what when he speaks about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the people were worshipping idols, and when he speaks about Allah, what does he say? He says that when I become sick, he's the one who cures. After mentioning he gives life and takes death, etc. He says, وَإِذَا مَرِدْتُ فَهُوَ يَشْفِينَ That when I become sick, then Allah is the one who cures. Recognizing what? 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Ashafi. One of his names is what? Is he's the Ashafi. He's the one who cures people when they go through illnesses. And moving on, uh, back to the story. And the boy, when he was summoned, So I'm getting messages yes, from the sisters volunteers. So as you all know, we're, we're having, actually I don't think the message has gone out yet, but uh, there seems to be a lot of problems on the sister side um, when it comes to noise, especially during Taraweeh, um, where the sisters unfortunately are distracting um, others who are here to pray. And we're going to talk about it at Taraweeh, but I'll mention it now because the message has come that again, the sisters are making a lot of noise. Uh, look, sisters, mashallah, we know that sisters like to talk, you know, mashallah. Um, but there's a time and place for talking, yes? Uh, when you're here in the masjid and taraweeh prayer is going on or talks are being given, then this isn't the time to talk, yes? Uh, the time to, to, this is the time to, to listen. Um, so it's a request from the sisters who are upstairs. Uh, if they could please reduce their talking, or actually not talking at all. If you want to talk, then go outside. MashaAllah, the weather's nice. You can sit outside and have a nice gupshap uh, in Tal Maghrib, no problem. But if you're sitting inside, then please don't disturb those who uh, are here to listen, inshaAllah. So I hope I don't get another message saying, please ask the, the, the sisters to quieten down again. I hope the message has been received, inshaAllah. Otherwise, I'll give Dr. Uthman the mic, and he's a lot more uh, aggressive than myself. Yeah. Um, so coming back inshallah. So now, as I said, the um, young boy's identity has uh, been disclosed. So the king, he um, summons the young boy. The young boy comes to the king and he, uh, the king questions him. He says, I heard you become proficient in magic, that you're curing the, the, the blind, you're healing the blind, etc, etc. And he said, I don't heal. Again, the young boy, he stood in front of the king, the most powerful person at the time. And he says, I don't heal. Look at the Iman, the strength. He said that healing comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Comes from God. Doesn't come from me. Um, and then the king began to torture him. He said, no, no, this was against completely what I'm trying to portray to the people is that you have to worship me. I'm the one in control here. There, there is no God other than me. Like Firaun. Yes, I'm your God. So he's saying this to him over and over again. So he begins to torture the boy. And he says, who's the one who taught you? Yeah, he wants to learn who's the one who taught you. There's somebody behind you. So now he reveals the identity of the monk. Okay, his teacher, uh, he reveals his identity. Of course, under that torture and under that persecution, he ends up revealing this. So the monk, he summons, uh, sorry, the king, he summons the monk. The monk now attends. He's sitting in front of the king. The king asks him, you know, who is it that you worship, etc. And he says, um, Allah, one God. And he tells him, turn back from, from your religion now. And he refuses to turn back from his religion. He refuses. And what does the king do? The hadith mentions in Sahih Muslim. He said that the king, he brings a saw and um, he places it in the middle of his head and he cuts right through the middle of his head. Yes, this was the result of what? Of, of the monk holding on to his belief in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, today we think that, you know, we're persecuted, there's Islamophobia, everyone's against Muslims, and there's, there's no doubt government policies and all of these things exist and there is discrimination against Muslims and whatnot. But look at what the people of the past had to go through. And just to hold on to their iman, hold on to their faith, hold on to their belief. And he's being cut in half. Why? Because he believes in one, one God. He believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but he didn't. Yes, he didn't give up on that belief. Till the end he, had, he held that belief. So when we go through difficulties now, that we go through, and there's no doubt we do go through difficulties as a community, um, we don't let that um, you know, crush our belief. What do you see now? SubhanAllah, unfortunately you find sometimes Muslims, they want to hide their identity as Muslims. Uh, we don't want to show maybe that you're, you're a Muslim at the workplace. Um, why you want to fit in? You don't want to stand out. You don't want to be different. Yes, so when it comes to your identity, who you are as a Muslim, you try to maybe hide, shy away from certain principles of our deen, etc. And that's wrong. Yes, we should be proud. You should be strong in your faith. You should be proud of your belief and your identity of who you are as a Muslim. It shouldn't be that there's a little bit of pressure and then, okay, you know what? Uh, I'm going to 
uh, tried to, to show that uh, I'm not a, a real Muslim. Yeah, I'm an easy-going Muslim. So everything goes in, in, in my, my Islam. No. And you be firm on your, your beliefs. So, um, after the, the monk is killed, the, um, the king then brings his companion, the one who was cured by the young boy. The one who was blind, but he was cured by the young boy. He calls him and he says to him the same thing, turn back from your religion. And this one, again, he did not turn back from his religion. He, stood, he held firm upon his religion. What happened to him? The exact same thing. A saw was placed in the middle of his head and his head was cut in two. Again, what? For his belief in Allah. And he didn't give up that belief until the last moment. And again, you imagine that moment. It's not an easy moment to go through. You know that the end is near. But you don't give up on your, your faith and your belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, then the young boy is brought. And the young boy is told the exact same thing. Turn back from your religion. So first it was the monk. Monk was killed. Then it was the king's companion who was cured. He was killed. Now he calls for the young boy. And the young boy comes and he says to them the same thing. Um, that turn back from your religion. He refused to do so. So what the king does this time, he wants to make an example of the young boy. Yes, and he wants to show all of the people that if you disobey me, then this is going to be your outcome. So he calls all of his soldiers and he tells them to take this young boy to the top of a mountain. And go to this top of the mountain and then um, ask him to renounce his faith, to turn back from his belief. If he turns back, then he can come back down. If he doesn't, then throw him off the top of the mountain. Yes, as I said, he wants to make an example of him. So the soldiers, they take him to the top of the mountain, they ask him to, refu to, to turn back from his deen, and he says no. He refuses to. And what happens then, subhanAllah, is um, the, the mountain starts to shake. Yes, the mountain starts to shake. And as the mountain is shaking, those who were on top from the soldiers, they all fall down and they are killed. And this young boy is saved. Yes, this young boy is saved. And he makes a dua as, as this is happening. He says, Oh Allah, save me from them however you will. Yeah, it's in your hands, Ya Allah. And the mountain, as I said, begins to shake. They all fall down and he comes walking back. Yes, he comes walking back. And this reminds you of a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ when he mentioned uh, to Ibn Abbas, عنهما, he said that always be mindful of Allah. Always keep Allah in your mind. And Allah will protect you. It's a long hadith. And in that then he mentions that إِذَا سَأَلْتَ فَاسْئِلِ اللَّهِ وَإِذَا سَأَلْتَ فَاسْئِلِ بِاللَّهِ He said that if you ask, then ask from Allah. And if you seek help, then seek help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he's telling this to Ibn Abbas who was a young boy. He's saying what? He's teaching him that look, when you, you need something and you're in need of something, then ask from who? Ask from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What do we do when we're in need of something? We will go through our phone book, right? Who's going to sort this out for me? Yes, and you go to this person, that person, and you'll try and get things sorted in your mind. And then, and maybe when all uh, possibilities are exhausted, you do what? You say, okay, let's just make du'ana. Yeah, nothing else has worked. But here, the Prophet is teaching us what? Is that no, first and foremost, you make du'a to Allah. First and foremost, you, if you ask, you ask from Allah. You seek help, you seek help from Allah. Does that mean you can't go to somebody else? No, of course not. You can go and ask from somebody else. But first and foremost, you go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Have that connection with Allah, that you ask from Allah. This young boy, he asked what? He asked from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's about to be thrown off the mountain. And that, as I said, is a key lesson for you and I. That in life, always, when you have any need, ask from Allah. Take the means, of course, but don't forget to ask from Allah. Why? Because everything is in the control of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything is in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's control. You might think that there's no possibility of getting out of the situation that you're in. And you, subhanallah, are you trying to limit the, the qudra of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can change the affairs like this. That's in the blink of an eye. So we learn what? Always ask from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, so when this boy walks down, the king asks, what, what's happened to my soldiers? And the boy, he says that, you know, Allah saved me from them. And so the king then gives him some more soldiers. And he tells the soldiers that take him now at this time, put him on a boat and take him to the middle of the ocean and ask him to renounce his face. And if he does so, um, then, you know, bring him back. But if he doesn't, then throw him overboard. So now what in the middle of an ocean? So again, he makes the same dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh Allah, save me from them, whichever way you please. That's however you want. What happens? The boat overturns, they're all drowned, and he comes walking back to the king. Now the king is thinking, how do I get rid of this boy? This is a musibah. Everybody knows what's going on. I'm trying to kill this young boy, and nothing's actually working. 
I'm, and I, again, you know that hadith that I mentioned of when you ask us from Allah, you know the ending of the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said that, no, if the whole world gathered to harm you with something, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't write for that to happen, then realize that the whole world wouldn't be able to harm you. That's if the whole world gathered to harm you, and Allah decrees that that harm is not going to come to you, then realize that that harm will not come to you. And if the whole world gathers to benefit you with something, but Allah does not decree that they're going to benefit you with that thing, then realize that um, that benefit will not come to you. Meaning what? Is that numbers don't matter. You know, subhanAllah, if you think we were in Medina on, on Umrah recently, and we were at the site of Khandaq, the Battle of Khandaq, there was 10,000 of the Quraysh who surrounded the city of Medina. Okay, they surrounded the city of Medina. They thought, that's it, it's over. This is the largest army that's ever gathered against the Muslims. Badr was a thousand, Uhud was three thousand. Now what? Ten thousand. And we've surrounded the city. There's no way out. But what? SubhanAllah, Allah teaches us time and time again. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to protect, He will protect, regardless of the numbers. So here again, this young boy, it, it seems that the end is near for him, but Allah, when Allah's protection is there, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's protection is there. And of course, it teaches us the importance of having tawakkul in Allah. Like this young boy, he had true tawakkul in Allah. He relied upon Allah. He was close to Allah, and then he put his affairs in the hands of Allah. It reminds me of the story, which we shared before. Um, the story of, you know that sister, the sister called Hala, uh, who um, in 1979, and so this is a sister from Syria, she says in 1979 my father decided that he wanted to move to America. smiling. You heard the story, yes? <laughs> Um, so he says that, uh, sorry, she says that in 1979 my father decided that uh, we want to move to America. So he moved first, okay, and myself, she's just a sister, myself, my mother and my siblings, we stayed behind and we were going to travel later. So my father arrived in California, he got settled and then it was time for us to travel. She says that we traveled and we got on, on the, the flight and it was uh, it landed in New York. And then from New York it was to go to Chicago and then from Chicago eventually to California. And she said in those days, um, when you were going to move on from your, when you landed to another, um, another city, you had to fill out a green card application. Okay, so she says, when we arrived in New York, I had to fill out this application. And a part of the application was you have to take a picture. And she said, I had recently started to wear hijab. And they told me that you have to take your hijab off for the picture. And she said, no, I refused. I said, I'm not going to take my hijab off. Why do I have to take my hijab off for the picture? And they said, no, you have to take it off. So this argument then ensued, and she refused. Now you can imagine, they've traveled from Syria, you know, across the world, they end up in America. The mother just wants to get to her husband, yeah, in California. Now this daughter who started wearing hijab is, is basically refusing to take her hijab off. And now time is passing by and they have to get on the flight, the flight to Chicago. And she keeps refusing. And now even the siblings are saying, look, just take it off, get the picture done so we can move. But she says, no. She said, why? You shouldn't have to take it off. Yeah, this is discrimination. I wear the hijab, you can still take the picture. Anyway, after three hours, the supervisor comes and he says, just take the picture with the hijab on. So they take the picture, but by that time the flight had left. So they missed the flight to Chicago. And then of course they missed the flight from Chicago to California. What happens is they don't know what's going to, I mean, what are we supposed to do now? We've got no money. How are we supposed to end up in California? So, subhanAllah, Qadr of Allah, they arranged then for her to get onto, a, the, the family to get onto the next flight, which is going to go direct to California now. So they don't have to stop in Chicago. Alright, direct to California. And they'll arrive at around the same time. So they get on that flight and they go direct to California. And subhanAllah, when they arrive in California, she says, my father comes and he gives us a hug and he's crying and he says, Allah saved you, Allah saved you. And then they're like, what's happened? What do you mean Allah saved us? And then he says, the flight that you were supposed to be on, yes, it was flight um, 191, American Airlines flight 191, you can even Google it. He said that that flight that was coming from Chicago to California crashed and all 271 people on board died. All 271 people on, died, on board died. And she says, SubhanAllah, what saved me was my hijab. And Allahu Akbar, look at that. This was her commitment 
And he, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved her from getting on that flight. And she arrives where in California, safe and sound. Everybody on the on the two, on the flight 191 dies. This shows you what Subhanallah. When you put your Allah Subhanahu wa Taala first, when you put your trust in Allah, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala makes ways. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala makes ways. Coming back, and we're getting late. What time is the iftar today? Forty. Forty-two. Forty-four. Mashallah, different times. Yeah. People are. Uh, Choosing your own times, huh? depending on how hungry we are. Anyone got the time or we're just going to go with the flow? 44. 44. You guys have been opening it early. <laughs> um, so now coming back to the story. Um, so now the king doesn't know what to do. So the boy says to the king, there's only one way you can kill me. He says, gather all of the people, right? Gather all of the people, tie me up against the tree, get an arrow, and say uh, in the name of the Lord of the young boy. Yes, if you do that, you'll be able to kill me. So the king now, he's fed up, he gathers all of the people. Yes, he gets the young boy, he ties him to the tree. He gets the arrow and he says in the, law, in the name of the, uh, the Lord of the young boy. And he shoots the arrow, and the arrow hits the young boy in the head, and the young boy dies instantly. Now what happens as a result? Everybody who's watching, all of those people who's watching, and the, the companions of the king said, what have you done? What you feared the most is going to happen now. That everybody's going to believe in the Lord of the boy. Yes, you tried everything to kill him. You couldn't kill him. Yes, every time Allah is saving him. And now he tells you what to do and says in the name of the Lord of the boy, and you do it and he's dead. So everybody who was watching, they said, we believe in the Lord of the young boy. Yeah, they all accepted Islam. So the king, he gets enraged. And what does he do? The king then, he tells his soldiers to build, to dig ditches. And they start to dig ditches. And this is where Surah Al-Buruj comes in. Yes, because Ashab al ukhdud as the Shaykh recited, is referring to the who? It's referring to those who were thrown into these ditches and burned alive. So they get these ditches, they dig these ditches and then they bring all of those who said that they believe in the young boy. And they said, renounce your faith now, otherwise you're going to be thrown into the, to the fire. And they stayed firm upon their belief. They did not give up their belief. They were thrown into the fire to the extent the hadith mentions that um, there was a woman who was carrying a child and she hesitated to jump in. As you can imagine, and you've got a young child with you, are you going to be jumping into this fire? So she hesitated. And the ch young child, baby, in the arms of the mother called out and said, Oh mother, be patient, for you're following the truth. Yes, you're upon the truth. And, uh, subhanAllah, like, uh, which other baby spoke in the arms of the mother? Isa. Isa alayhi salam. Exactly. That's what did Isa alayhi salam say? He said not to speak to anyone. That was his mother. mother was told not to speak to anyone. Anyone know what Isa alayhi salam said in the uh, arms when he was in the arms of his mother? In the Abdullah. In the Abdullah. Mm -hmm. That I am the slave of Allah. Come on, Ashir. Is it I am the slave of Allah? <sighs> MashaAllah, you were listening. Well done. <laughs> yes, I am the slave of Allah. Excellent. What else did he say? What comes after that? So Allah has given me the scripture and he's made me a prophet. Yes? And he's commanded me with what? We talked about this in the reminder. You guys are sleeping in the reminder. Man. <laughs> um, and he's commanded me with salah and zakah as long as I live. So this is, subhanAllah, the story of the boy and the king. What do we learn? We've obviously touched on many of the lessons um, as we've been going along. But this was the ultimate sacrifice. You know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He describes it as what? ذَلِكَ الْفَوْزُ Azim. Azim wa kabir. ذَلِكَ الْفَوْزُ Kabir. Sah? Kabir. This is the great victory. You know, these people, they've been punished, they've been persecuted, they've been thrown into a fire. They've died, and Allah says it's a great victory. Why does Allah describe it as a great victory? Why? Because ultimately what? From a dunyawi perspective, you might think that their lives have gone. But ultimately what? They've achieved 
the Akhirah. They've, they've achieved success with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's the great victory. The great victory is what? Is that when you leave this dunya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with you. When you leave this dunya, you've done enough what that will get you into Jannah through, through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. That's the great victory. So despite yani, being persecuted, tortured, thrown into the fire, Allah is seeing that they've what achieved the great victory. And that's the victory that we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He gives to all of us.